So please give a warm round of applause to Philippe Langlois. Hi guys, thank you very much for this warm, warm welcome. So uh, since we we're talking about something warm, we are going to talk about uh, HLR, basically is a, the database of subscriber of phone network. Whatever you're using as a phone network right now, you have to go through that to actually receive SMS and make calls. And since it's warm, it may be hot. And these days it's hot because the king of the HLR has a good tendency to be crashing these days. So um, here, um, what's funny is that um, this technology is supposed to be super strong, robust. This is something that is a critical infrastructure, as they call it. Well, um, in reality, it's just a big box like this. And doesn't look really like much, except it wouldn't feel in your bedroom. Um, but um, basically, this is what interconnects all the different operators between each other to know when you're roaming where to get the signal to. Um, the kind of thing we've seen is actually uh, very interesting in the last uh, few, few years. Uh, we've seen a lot of crashes. Uh, actually, four days ago, SFR in France had uh, something like four-hour downtime. Uh, this is getting super usual, whereas back in the days, uh, like let's say the beginning of the GSM network era, it was quite actually less uh, prevalent. So now what we have is we have plenty of uh, crashes happening right and left. And uh, very often they say, oh, we connected a new box, and this box made the HLR crash. Right? So uh, that's actually the, the most open way. The, the less open way is um, basically this kind of uh, statement. Um, yeah, basically, yes, it was a crash, but since it was due to malformed traffic, it is not a vulnerability because it was not an attacker who attacked. Hello? You, you spot the logic problem. Okay. The thing we see here is that in the telco, the mindset is different from the internet um, sphere, I would say. In our sphere of telco, people are, when you, t when you tell them security, they hear load, capability to sustain 100,000 simultaneous calls, 500,000 simultaneous users or subscribers in the area. They don't think someone sending person N or person P and uh, having fun while uh, some uh, massive stack go goes down thanks to a stupid uh, format string. So the the kind of uh, malicious intent is never present, and there's not really much um, a culture of security just due to the fact that not enough people were attacking them. So they are less uh, sensitive to security issues than if, for example, uh, thousands of hackers had pounded them in the SS7 network for years. Since they were underexposed, they're somehow uh, undersensibilized. Okay? So, that's then the, the biggest question is like, oh yeah, Philippe, you're saying once again a nice story, but how do I attack that myself? And actually, uh, there's quite a few things which are um, accessible to normal operators, which are considered to be com completely out of, uh, how to say, out of your reach. And um, what happens is very often uh, the thing that is uh, presented into these, uh, basically into this these discussion about security, is that you can only attack this stuff if you are yourself another operator or if you are into the backbone of operators roaming exchange called the GRX, basically if you are already in the place. And this attack surface is actually huge. So you're like, okay, this is tempting, this is like a very uh, lovely cake in front of me, but I can't access it. I, the signaling interface, you have to be an operator to, to be connected to it. Billing interface, you need to be an internal employee or a reseller to be connected to it. Uh, provisioning interface, for example, plenty of new cards, SIM cards, arrive at an operator because uh, uh, SRL demonstrated that uh, all the, the previous uh, SIM cards are completely broken. And uh, you'll see the presentation tomorrow. And basically, you need to provision these provisioning interfaces. Then operation and maintenance, the famous or infamous OEM interface, only if you're an administrator. 
reporting interface is basically all also the billing everything. So it looks like very interesting, a lot of attack surface, but actually you can't access it. Well, this is totally wrong. Because uh, contrary to what operators believe that they do internal controls, so their uh, HLR is secure, the security of these machines is up to the level of protection of the least secured operator in the world. Time to intrusion to a not very well secured uh, operator is about one day to two days. The average intrusion, time to intrusion, for a normal telecom operator is two weeks. So this is easy. And as soon as you broke into one uh, network operator, think, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, less developed countries uh, which don't have so much uh, means for their security, well, you have access to these internal signaling networks. And that's when the fun uh, starts to, to hit. Um, is that each of them are interconnected. Here I show an interconnection uh, with diameter. There's two kinds of interconnection. The new ones is diameter. It's called as an IPX uh, network. And it's a global, fully meshed kind of uh, um, roaming network between all the operators that do roaming. So right now on Dimeter, it's mostly uh, the LTE networks and uh, what we call the IMS networks, basically new kind of technologies. And the old technology is SS7. I spoke about that uh, sometime before, so let's not, let's not get into detail. And this, this IPX provider, as soon as you're into one, the kind of access that you have to the operators is typically full without any kind of filtering. And for example, uh, very simple su stuff that happened to us is we were on the IPX network at some point, and we were like looking into it, or it was uh, basically uh, the exposure of the operator to all the other operator. And on this, there was a Solaris machine with login root and password root. Okay. That was 2012. So in terms of uh, idea of security, they say, oh, everything is good, it's a walled garden. But in reality, there's not only a huge attack surface in terms of systems, but also there's a huge complexity. This complexity is somehow going down thanks to the adoption of uh, new protocols. So I was talking about this diameter protocol. Um, now it's fairly standardized over IP. You have basically SCTP or TCP, and you put it on top of, um, um, of these uh, very well-known transport systems. And you are going to have your diameter application, and diameter is just a tube, an encoding. If you remember, basically, radius, it's just a radius on steroids. But the problem, as soon as you have this new technology, it's a bit like the XKCD uh, comic about standards. There's too many standards, let's do one that unifies them all. Because there are 33 standards so far, so we need to, to, to make these seize. And then you create a new standard, and there are 34 standards. Okay. And that's the problem in telco, is that you have also all the legacy applications which still enable the communication with the HLR, because on these systems, you will be able to phase out this interface only when the last operator who still use them will have phased it out on the planet. So that means basically never. And what you have is this kind of legacy sandwich. So what you have on top is this crispy LT kind of new technology, mm, very yummy, very oh, IP ready, blah, blah, blah. But on the bottom, it's like slushy, full of water, dead sandwich from the 1970s. And this kind of technology is as secure, and they say it's very secure. It's on SS7, so it's secure, for example, on the left side. Well, the sequence ID to prevent spoofing are not only positive increment, they are positive sequential increment. And we are in 2013. Anybody who studied TCP IP stack, you show a stack that does like this on sequence number of TCP, and it goes rolling on the floor laughing. Well, this is still what protects each of your um, uh, cell phone communication in your pocket right now. And this technology is still going to stay in this HLR for a long time. Uh, also, on top of it, you have now many things that are uh, stacking up also from the bottom. Because all these things, when it started to be parted toward IP, then 
people said, oh, I need management. So I need also, uh, I need MPLS backbone, and I need carrier in Ethernet in order to be able to transport this easily over my nationwide network. So the number of stack that, go, uh, that went under these existing technology is really growing. And as soon as you have the single glitch into this supporting network, basically all the rest of the top application goes down too. So it's quite a, a, a bridging of technologies with many different kinds of technologies, IP, legacy SS7, etc. But it's also a lot of different technologies in terms of what builds these HLR. The thing is, what builds this HLR when you speak about one system, it's rarely only one system. It's one logical system, which is a cluster of, say, 20 nodes, and each of these nodes has some custom hardware, uh, then some new evolution, what the telecom called ATCA, basically running everything on top of uh, x86 and uh, Linux. Well, everything also accumulates in terms of technology. So you'll have some super old VX works running on top of FPGA, which are uh, running on dedicated boards. And at the same time, next to it, you'll have a uh, fully redundant two Linux system, which are just open SUSE, who are running big Java and Corba uh, fat application developed in C++. And so if you look at all this stuff, basically, it's massive. It's easily a few gigs of binaries. I'm just talking about the binaries that you execute in order to make such kind of system. So on top of it, you have sometimes some completely crazy applications, such as, for example, the Ericsson uh, Plex application. So basically, they develop their own language, their own environment, their own ASIC, their own processors, the uh, infamous APZ. And they, at the same time, push new uh, technology layer on top of it. So what is sexy is really when we talk about hacking, wow, OK, this guy is going to show IDA and now go into some basic block and, and do some, whoa, magic. Well, forget about it. It's so massive that the two tools you're going to use to first start reverse engineering and finding vulnerabilities into this is going to be strings and your space bar. Because you're going to be, oh, OK, oh, I start to get it. Oh, interesting. IDA for this? OK, try to run IDA already on one of these fat binaries, which is already easily 200 megabyte. No, this is not going to work. You're not going to even do something successful in limited time that you have. OK, so the other stuff is you say, OK, if the static part is quite hard, uh, let's go to the, uh, the dynamic part. Well, interesting is that it's a lot of workflow into the HLR. Uh, you pick up your phone, you register on the base station, the base station forward your message uh, to the MSC, the MSC communicate with the HLR in order to locate you in this cell. Well, each time this kind of message arrives into the HLR, then what happens is that you're going to have, for example, uh, communication stacks such as Dimeter or SS7, who decodes everything, who forwards that to a big C++ application, which then propagates that to a database and a broker on the Corba bus so that callbacks can be called. So what you have is that one single message is going to trigger a lot of um, event into these machines. And not only one machine, but one machine between 20 of the cluster. So the tracing of this part is extremely difficult. And the only thing that you can say is, I'm going to focus on this, and I want to find a limited vulnerability, for example, on the diameter stack. Because if you try to follow the whole chain, basically, this is not going to work. The interesting thing is that more and more, the signaling that comes from your mobile phone goes towards these HLR quite unfiltered. It used to be transformed a lot. But now, in order to scale, the signaling can actually flow directly untouched from the user up to the HLR HSS, basically specifically into the LT networks. You'll be able to ask Xavier, who is uh, right here doing uh, heavy work on this. The signaling, which is on top of your mobile phone, is actually going quite directly. And so that means that the attack surface is even increasing from what scales the most the telecom operator, your exposure. But even, as I said, if it's not the main problem yet. So 
Okay, as an introduction, basically we have a few data pointers. Now, what about the vulnerabilities that you really have into this kind of telecom equipment? Well, HLR, basically, and uh, it's uh, now a new name, which is HSS, uh, just the same thing, but for the new technologies such as LTE and IMS, are actually just big machines, which are database on one side, communication engine and communication stack on the other side. And um, what we had as an interesting thing from a customer is to say, OK, uh, I had a crash. I want to reproduce it. Um, how can I do that? And actually, um, this is uh, what we had as a result from a simple equivalent of piping dev random directly onto the pro appropriate signaling port. Nothing more. And when we started to do something a bit more intelligent, which is just an append fuzzing, which is really dumb fuzzing still, Basically, we were even able to reach multiple, uh, vulnerabi multiple buffer overflows, multiple vulnerabilities within their stack. So basically, the easiest way was to consider that these things that are supposed to be critical infrastructure would fall for what even the most stupid HTTP server uh, on the internet would not fall for. So how do you explain that? And the guy tells you, well, we have done fuzzing. The thing is that it's shallow fuzzing. It never goes up the big stacks that I showed you of technology in the beginning. It only fuzz, let's say, SCTP or TCP, the transport part, sometimes even only the encapsulation part, diameter or M3UA. But really, to fuzz what is interesting is to fuzz the higher application. When you attack a web server, you're going to try to attack the CGIs and web app. You're not going to try to attack Tomcat or Apache or Nginx. Well, that's the same. The guy focused on security saying, OK, I take a security product, I apply it on telecom, I did telecom security. No, wrong. You just stayed too shallow. You didn't fuzz the upper, upper layers. So interestingly, um, when you start applying what is called in internet zone dump fuzzing, for example, uh, Laurent Gaffier kind of style of 10 line of Python, well, this is advanced fuzzing for telco, because even if you do this kind of super, super simple kind of fuzzing, replace one random value at a one random location and flip one bit or flip the byte, well, this will enable you to still pass through some of the decoding that is done. So the decoding stack is going to let that pass one time out of two, statistically. And even this has not been done. So basically, here, you'd say, this is not possible. That, that cannot happen. Why can this happen? Well, what is very interesting is that um, the operators are much more trustful of their technology providers, such as Ericsson, Huawei, even Huawei, they trust very, uh, it very much, uh, Alcatel, Luce, uh, everyone like this, these big vendors, because the operators made their money based on these technology providers who came to them and said, oh, I have a new technology, it's called 3G. You're going to make fortunes out of it. And basically, the trust relationship is really here. So you can't kill that easily. And the thing is, when you show up and say, oh, but basically, there are something like 18 zero days into your HLR, they're like, oh, cannot happen. I know this guy. They are serious. They would not make that to us. They would not do this to us. Okay? And only when there start to be some doubt, for example, uh, the doubts about uh, backdoors in Huawei, then they start to say, OK, so maybe there's something really wrong. And uh, for example, something really wrong, which is okay, a nice way to put it, is on a 2,500 basic block for functionalities into one Huawei product, 200 of, 250 of it were backdoors. Oh, OK, calm down. What is a backdoor? Uh, it's pre-authentication, remote code execution, or command execution, or password information leak. Does that qualify as a backdoor for you? OK, so here we see there's a trust problem toward the security, uh, or toward the insecurity of these machines. And they always want to keep it private, be it the operator or actually the vendors. Because if it's kept private, then they won't have so much problem than if the real news is out. And real news is rarely out. For example, one of the times uh, where the real news about telecom insecurity was uh, quite uh, 
uh, obvious to everyone, was the Athens affair, when basically uh, I think Vodafone was uh, uh, fine. Uh, Vodafone and, uh, and Ericsson were fined a, a few hundred million, I, I believe, something like a, uh, each a bit like 80 million uh, euro. And in this time, when this kind of disclosure, disclosure happen, well, they get hurt. So uh, they will try to keep that at all costs, under water, not, not present it. And very often they say, well, you say you found a minor bug and the bug has been fixed. Well, the thing is, uh, it was even our dumb fuzzers that found the, these few crashes. And when they say fixed, is that it was fixed for only these things, uh, things Microsoft patching approach of the before uh, 2004. Okay, that was like really focused on something super small. And let's go on. This guy is not going to have a look again on these machines. Uh, very interestingly, some of these bugs uh, were uh, Heisen bugs. Uh, that means that um, you want, as an operator, to have a lot of forensic capabilities. And they turned on uh, the core dumping of some of all, actually, their HLR front end. But the problem is each of these HLR front end is something like a huge machine, like huge Solaris machines. And each time it crashed, it dumped the whole memory, which was easily a few hundred gigs. And basically, uh, the box was actually totally blocked while core dumping. So the guy said, oh, you can't crash that, because this is anyway a big cluster of a lot of different HLR. And you say, yeah, but one packet crash one machine for two minutes, the time for it to, to dump the core dump. So what happened is that you just have to send 20 packets every two minutes. How hard is that? Okay. So when you cross the technical uh, barrier and uh, start discussing really uh, things, you're actually lucky. Because before that, you went through that amount of total stupidity communicating with the researcher. Do you have a license for our product? No, uh, it's uh, basically our customer who does. Yes, but you've not been trained on our product, so how can you find vulnerabilities? And I don't understand. Are you from the government or regulator? Because who authorized to touch your, our machines? Uh, it's your customer machines, not your machines. This kind of really third dimension spoke I'm on, on a new planet. And really even like questions about security which make you a bit uh, scared, like what is fuzzing? Well, hello, 2013, uh, are we from the past? So it's really these kind of things. Now, actually, it's still lucky when they are not just plain lying to you. Um, for example, we don't store any kind of KIs that would enable uh, replication of, uh, basically, uh, do SIM cloning, replication of SIMs. And we have always encrypted KI, this very pre precious key. Oh, yeah, I saw the encrypted KI uh, um, column in the table. It's just next to the KI table. <laughs> so, but we're still safe. We are still safe because this stuff has no way to be on the Internet. Oh, shit, Shodan. NetBIOS responds, HLR from ZT. Uh, Huawei is only scared about one guy. It's ZT because they are, always, they are also Chinese and they are competing against each other. So ZT is really the dirt cheap kind of equipment, which works nicely, uh, actually. And basically, you find some uh, Windows machine that is controlling the HLR, uh, basically, of some operator. OK. And this is Shodan. So we're like, ooh, OK, uh, that starts to be interesting. But actually, it's a controlling machine. It's maybe not directly uh, the machine itself. Well, wrong. Um, here, what we find is a Tekelec STP. So actually, the Tekelec STP is the heart of any kind of telecom backbone, uh, what we call SS7. That's the SS7 router. That is signaling transfer point. If you don't have an STP, you don't have a network. So this is present everywhere. And here we see directly the core router of a single operator being exposed on the internet. Like uh, ping minus F is very often sufficient to take CPU of the administration module to 100 person, making this unmanageable. Of course, it's redundant, it's, so there's always 
a few cards that still processes the traffic. But with, even with a ping minus F, you can start to doze this machine partially. And it's on the internet. Worse than this, there's a Shodan bias. Uh, the thing is, Shodan is actually only showing 10% of this kind of equipment. And why is that? Is that Shodan scans for what Shodan cares about. SSH, Telnet, HTTP. Does it scan for SCTP? Does it scan for proprietary interfaces? Does it scan for uh, the kind of administration port called MML, Man Machine Language? No, it doesn't. And very often, it will even confuse some of these machines because, for example, one common port for MML access is the port 6000. And on port 6000, you all know that you're going to try X Windows probe. You're not going to try telco specific probes. Okay? And so what happens is that on some of the Shodan, we were like very uh, scared by the result, and we said, oh, may maybe with this bias, we can have more. And we started to scan the internet with our own tools to scan specifically for these uh, critical infrastructure machines. And the result is that easily we found something from 10 to 20 times more machines. Okay. And that means that basically there's a whole network which are exposed on the internet. No. Okay, the most fun is to show Shodan because when back at home, you'd be able to reproduce that and say, oh, <laughs> finally, it's much more accessible than I thought. The thing is, there's also a shift in terms of danger. Uh, the thing is, we went into a world in 2011 where actually some people were actively exploiting that to make money. So actually, back in the 90s, you could say, OK, hackers are bad. They are really visiting systems in a bad way. And then people started to exploit that for sending spam and uh, extracting uh, uh, financial information. And you're like, OK, that was not so bad, actually, at that time. Well, that's exactly the case. Some people broke into an HLR and actually got passively, uh, from what we've seen, uh, basically got passively the dump of data of SIM, SIM card, basically subscriber records, which enables them to reflash new SIM cards and make SIM clones. And this was resold exactly in the same way as credit cards. Hey, they are cheap, $5, five my SIM card, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So on underground forums. So that triggers uh, a very uh, important message in terms of threat inte intelligence is that it's not only some uh, random hacker plus uh, intelligence agencies of the world who are routing telecom operators. Now, script kiddies are going to go at it in order to generate profit. OK, let's. Um, so, also, the thing is, you say, OK, here you're talking mostly about the, the big intelligence, the big machines which are still not so often present uh, on the internet. Well, the thing is, everything that is connected to these things, to these HLR HSS, are also very trusted because these are in a private garden, a walled garden. So the mindset in terms of security architecture is to say, we can connect everything there, it's going to be secure. So you see some very um, peripheral network elements, such as the media gateway, who are actually directly connected to the signaling network. And from there, you can spoof any kind of message using some very nice uh, pre-authentication, uh, remote uh, signaling uh, um, kind of commands. And this is, OK, once again, what we call a backdoor, because it enables you to send any kind of arbitrary signaling onto the SS7 network from an unauth unauthenticated connection to a very peripheral system. So even if the guy now start to some telco are enlightened. Some tel telco were burnt and react. And so, so this little group, which is basically from 10 to 20% of the telco, they start to pay attention. But even if they start to pay attention to a critical system, all these things is so fully meshed that attacking the less important systems gives you the same kind of access. You're going to be able to spoof signaling. You're going to be able to send, basically, command in a pre-authenticated way. And basically, not many people are caring. And the actors themselves are trying to uh, hide it from the next uh, people. The vendors try to hide it for the operator so that the operator doesn't see that this telecom infrastructure is so broken. 
the telecom operator try to hide it from the national regulator so that they don't get fined by the government for being insecure. And the telecom um, regulation and government and the security agencies try not to scare too much the public because, uh, you know, that could create problems. So it's like a little train of uh, people playing games on each other's back. And this basically still goes on. We reported that in 2007, still not fixed. Oh, and by the way, very interesting thing uh, about reporting. When you report, never report for free. So people say, oh, but Mr. Langlois, you, you must adhere to responsible disclosure. And say, oh, no, I don't do that. I adhere to professional disclosure. If you're my customer, you're going to be actually caring and fixing for this vulnerability much quicker than if I give it for free. I have stats for this. And so as soon as we started to say, oh, we, we don't deal if we don't have a contract, then the people were actually, since they were paying for getting the vulnerability, well, they were actually fixing the problem much more quickly. Crazy, but that's what works. Um, so just to, to give an idea about uh, the kind of things that you see into these, uh, into these kind of uh, um, equipment. Uh, here, um, you'll see that actually they are very nice for the reverse engineer. They give you everything, including the debug image. Uh, they don't really uh, strip stuff. Uh, they like big uh, static, uh, statically compiled uh, programs, not re remove the symbols, whatever. Even uh, debug mode is very often accessible. And uh, the, the protection is totally opposite when you're doing vulnerability research on this equipment than to our uh, IP world. The protection is the sheer size of this network element. You're going to be so lost for so many months that actually you're not going to come up with a way on how I'm going to exploit that. Yet the exploitation is really trivial, and you get plenty of details. They give you what kind of implementation they run on. They're even that nice to give you ASCII art of the PCB where the soft is running. Okay. And since they had a little bit of time on their hand, they put some ASCII heart about uh, some kind of uh, like angel attacking an octopus. This is in the firmware, and it's not displayed. Wonderful. And you start to now um, get um, some uh, very nice uh, knowledge, intimate knowledge about some uh, Chinese developers, uh, because you start to understand why they name the stuff the cool beauty system or heavy, uh, heaven winds and stuff like that. And there's even some things which are uh, even poetic in this domain. For example, what I love is this tiny format string that is actually uh, susceptible to some attacks on the bottom of this little screen. And it, yeah, you see there's, there's a dimension. It's not macho heavy, I rope uh, my way into your stack. No, here is subtle, please exploit me, but this is... Uh, <laughs> also, they love crypto. And uh, they really love crypto by having it in a very nice way also, because they will uh, use any kind of crypto, especially uh, AES, DES, but with hard-coded keys and just shifting, so encoding, like, like obfuscation. Because it's cool to say I'm using AES, but it's really a pain to be shipping different certificates for each install. So when you reverse engineer one of these systems, you have the keys for all the systems. Man in the middle, back again, as if it was clear, as if it was clear text. Also, you see some uh, very nice implementation, for example, here implementation of uh, <coughs> some uh, FTP server. Uh, can, you, can you see the vulnerability there? OK, delay percent %s, that calls bin rm percent %s. Um, yeah, no? Yeah, meta character insertion back in the, in the 80s. The bugs of the, the 80s. Does anyone remember 8LGM here? Yeah, OK, some old school guys. Basically, these kind of bugs into uh, HPUX, month of uh, HPUX, HPUX bugs and stuff like that. This is the, the past coming back to life. OK. Also, what is funny is that um, these guys are also upgrading technologies. Uh, we make fun 
about uh, um, lack of protection in telco, but actually they are doing a lot of work in order to bring you LTE, in order to bring uh, new speed, uh, less time to connect the calls, etc. So they are upgrading their network uh, to new uh, IP backbone, and they encapsulate everything onto IP and trying to, to, to get things done. And doing so, uh, things grow. What was encoded in the past on 14-bit, in one second, now it's 16-bit. Ah, it's going to be better aligned. But then when you send some value which fit precisely into 16-bit and are just copied, like here, think integral overflow, onto the destination address, what happens is that you have Ericsson STP that just crashes. And you're like, oh, OK. I, it's like I sent a pink packet to 255, uh, 255, 255, 255 kind of address, and then the router crash. Uh, that sounds not good. Well, it's just basically integral overflow, uh, 1980s kind of vulnerabilities. But the guy are like, yeah, but you don't know what you're doing. We are going to really come to the root cause of that because we have a great uh, forensic tool and signaling analyzer called a -Log Fine, and they run it, and boom, on the same traffic. Exception, the thing crash. And that's called sharing. Uh, when you have a bug into one part of the stack, you pretty much have the stack all over the products, and you can exploit all the product with the same attack. Okay. And that was a forensic tool. I, I loved it. Okay, and you have the same thing on basically uh, some MSC. So the MSC is really what anchors you to the network. In, in LT, it's called the MME actually. Um, and these things keep a memory of who is here. It's the visitor location register. And they also have a switching function. This guy is calling, so let's connect him with that other guy is calling. And for that, they use some kind of a port, just as you have TCP ports. Well, in SS7, you have a subsystem numbers. Well, in that case, just sending an empty packet, or nearly empty packet, just well formed but empty packet, to one subsystem number that was not present on the machine before but had been activated. OK, uh, basically, it's a bit like I started a system after uh, the system start, well, by doing that, remote crash of the system. The system is scheduled to reboot in 15 minutes. And uh, when you have one of the systems which reboots, that means that a, um, a town the size of, uh, uh, let's say, Rotterdam loses connectivity for 15 minutes. OK? So that's kind of sizable. Well, the thing is, um, this stuff is once again a bit protected by its complexity. Uh, when you go reverse this specific processor, it's a nightmare. Like a brain fuck compared to that is just a nice programming language. So now the thing is, HLR has uh, evolved a lot. Uh, HLR is now called in 4G LT uh, domain uh, the HSS. Uh, basically, um, they um, started to port everything on IP and starting to um, okay, think about evolving to, to the next generation. So LT is really a, a break in terms of uh, technology. It's um, removing all the SS7 uh, kind of legacy. You still need to interconnect, and we'll see why. But at least the new network is running totally over IP. Well, the thing is, which is very interesting, is that uh, for LT, they really try to, at the specification level, the people in the 3GPP mostly, uh, try to make it very nice and uh, try to really make it secure. But once again, in, in a way which is not really uh, attacker-minded. They are too academic in their treatment of security. And what happened is that they said, every kind of signaling which is going to be now transported by uh, the diameter, also the, this evolution of radius, has to go over a security mechanism. And it's either TLS or IPsec. OK, so, so far so good. Um, this, is, this is a nice concept. But they said, OK, you can choose whatever you want. And why one or the other? That's my question. Because now what happens 
is that as everyone is late for deployment project all the time, you're always late for your work, it always go uh, slower than you would, what happens is that they say, oh, we're not going to do TLS, we're going to do IPsec. And they say, oh, and I don't have time for IPsec, so I'll put it later. So what you have now is really diameter with running plain text over IP. Even though on all the specification you'll, you'll be reading, it must. So the guy, by not enforcing the fact that it had to be running TLS whatsoever, be the encryption under this, then they made it even less secure than Radius. Because at least in Radius, you had a shared key, the famous or infamous shared secret. Well, in Dimeter, you don't even have it. Okay? So in reality, the impact of Dimeter is being less secure than the plain or Radius wear. Scary, isn't it? And it's being used everywhere. It's being used between, basically, half of the network. All the left parts that you see, what we call the EU tran uh, basically uh, the LT uh, radio access network, is using special protocols for radio, basically uh, uh, communication with the MME and handover between the different base stations. But all the rest use mainly Dimeter to be communicating. So it's a huge, uh, huge protocol into this domain. So what you have into this, um, into these, uh, basically, uh, vulnerabilities that we start uh, seeing into this equipment is still the same kind of complexity and, uh, how to say, vastness of this domain. For example, this is, I'm sorry, oops. Um, this is, for example, a single, simple um, HLR, HSS that runs uh, basically, everywhere it's the same. Uh, you go in Indonesia, uh, you go in uh, Pakistan, you go in Europe, you'll see these boxes. One form or another, but you'll see always these boxes. And what happens is that these boxes are huge in terms of network. You have at least in there something like 40 to 50 different network just for the internal functioning of it. And the kind of vulnerabilities that you see is each time you're digging a little bit more, you see a new layer of technology with a new layer of vulnerability. So at one time, we hit the layer of the management interface, what are called the local maintenance terminal, which runs on a separate uh, Ethernet um, LAN, which is on the back plane of this equipment. And on there, it's all Java and nice kind of technology, and with, of course, encryption, and since you have encryption, and they love encryption, well, they put hard-coded key just right there. So that you just need to use this, and basically you're back in clear text, because the encryption layer doesn't mean anything anymore. Hard-coded technologies. So each time you're going to be digging, you're going to be stopped dealing with, with one vulnerability, and it's super hard to do a breadth-first search of vulnerability in there, because you'll keep finding some, okay? So you'd be laughing and say, well, oh, that's great. Actually, that's not great. Because when you're working for an operator, you'd be 100% sure that you won't find all the vulnerabilities, and even sometimes you'll find trivial ones. So we keep running into new kind of vulnerabilities, and uh, you'll see it's uh, going to be uh, interesting. Oh, so one thing that is very interesting with uh, Huawei is that uh, some customers asked us, oh, uh, actually, can you detect that with uh, IDS? And we are like, oh, actually, we can use uh, just random Suricata IDS to, to implement that. And they said, OK, just IPS it, terminate the connection. So the guy actually asked us to terminate connection of things where people who connect there are doing super critical stuff. And what we found out is that sometimes some of the management software is actually using these undocumented, undocumented features to do management. So you have to be super careful here. Into <laughs> First, these are backdoors sometimes are even used legitimately, but they are backdoors. OK, so um, in terms of, uh, of evolution, uh, we are going toward uh, a very interesting um, place where basically the operator said, uh, we learned our lessons, uh, the vendor said, we learned our, our lessons, so we are going to do stronger encryption. Uh, if one key is compromised, we are going to make sure that not all the keys are compromised, and uh, we are really going to do it right. And uh, what happened is that they produced something like 
comprehensive. This, this is just the key scheduling of LT. I've ever heard about complexity fails in terms of security. Well, here, look at the number of transform on each of the keys and the number of keys. And this is happening each time you do a connection to LT. So of course, here, what is maybe not going to be broken immediately in terms of crypto is going to be broken in terms of implementation, because how can you not fuck up when you have to implement this? Another very interesting part is that uh, when uh, you take a crowbar and go into a field and open forcibly a base station, you tend to have some hardware that you don't know about. Okay? And really, this is a well-known attack that is really uh, something happening. And uh, very often, the way that the perpetrators go away from this is by calling the operators themselves and saying, oh, uh, I am uh, the farmer in the field uh, number three. Uh, I bump into your equipment, uh, and uh, I uh, think he's a bit damaged, but uh, it's functioning OK. And just it's a guy who came in and uh, just opened the, the BTS, and he's going to do bad stuff. But the thing, in, the thing is, in 3G, what happened is that this was actually some things that were running with ATM interface. Here, who has ATM interface on his laptop in this room? Yeah, nobody. You're all normal, good people. Who has Ethernet interface on their laptop? Everyone, OK? And the thing now, everything is carried over Ethernet. So what is going to be just amazing is now the kind of technology that you have to hack is something that everyone knows. So in terms of attack surface, maybe it didn't change. In terms of threat surface, it just exploded. And all eNode Bs need to actually talk to each other eNode B. So what happens is that you have a big L2 nationwide network, low latency, all optical, which is basically unfiltered at the radio level. I give my prediction that within two years, we'll see some busting story by cops who uh, break into some house of some gamers because the gamers found that they had really low latency onto this uh, network, which was quite accessible. It's easy, it's unfiltered. And since it's unfiltered and it's easy, it's probably going to be used. Also, the thing is, um, it's quite well secured in uh, things that, uh, for example, um, you have, oh, you can't see that, yeah. You have security between um, the, the core of the network and the radio access network. So even if the radio access network gets full of bad stuff, well, you have these security gateways which protect the MME and the HLR behind, or the HSS. What happens is that still, these equipment need to be talking to the management, here it's an Ericsson uh, scheme, uh, like a document which uh, presents how they are interconnected. And the Ericsson management system, OSSRC, is never in the spec, because this is something like uh, specific to them. And since it's not in the spec, it has not been thought in terms of securing this. So it's accessible by everyone, and if you manage to compromise this, then you can jump into the core network. Okay. So, what we have interesting is that Ericsson and all the vendors love to have blueprints that they stamp everywhere. So if you find one vulnerability in Ericsson deployment methods or Huawei deployment methods, it's going to be present in each of the operators where they deploy this technology mix. Okay? So this is also something uh, a bit scary. In terms of technology mix, they love to integrate different kind of uh, hardware into uh, these, uh, basically, boxes. You don't replace the radio card, you just replace the LT access card, etc., etc. And you replace one Ethernet switch by one optical switch, etc., etc. What is very interesting is that, of course, in terms of technology accumulation, you end up having a lot of different systems which have their own vulnerabilities. Here, for example, Siena Networks, uh, running Linux 2.0, okay? The kernel of this box, which is the, the core network at the optical level, it's really uh, extremely cool uh, networking equipment, Linux 2.0 kernel. Come on, guys. Okay. In terms of um, operating, uh, operating systems, um, basically, you have things that are quite proprietary, but everything is going toward uh, 
um, uniformization to Linux. So it becomes also very attackable because they like these kind of proven technologies. They like to use stuff that works. And stuff that works, for example, is a DNS. So another perspective to it is that they put everything into DNS in order to store such things such as the APN, that was usual, but now also all the different roles in terms of technologies. Uh, so your MME list is going to be totally listed into the DNS. And what that means is that here, with just DNS access, you have an instant mapping of the whole network. Another proven technology is GTP. I spoke about uh, this uh, a bit uh, uh, in, in, in another presentation. Uh, what is really interesting is that it's exploding. GTP vulnerability and GTP coverage is exploding because this is really the roaming about data. So what happens in there is that we are going to have even much more vulnerabilities into these network because they are just bloating the GTP protocol with new support for new features. And GTP is UDP. GTP is something that enables to do remote shutdown with one spoofed UDP packet. So what could possibly go wrong there? And um, the GRX, the old network for roaming, is being replaced and merged with IPX, which integrates not only GTP, DNS technology, but the diameter technology too. So all this is going to be in a big network, which used to be insecure and used to be accessible uh, without filtering from any operator once you were in the operator kind of club. So this makes kind of uh, deadly combos. Uh, deadly combos is basically diameter and encrypted plus uh, lack of uh, proper segmentation, or actually it's not really possible to do proper uh, segmentation of the L2 network. Plus, uh, for example, um, Ethernet technology. Uh, once again, the ones that I uh, spoke about, um, IP second diameter, IP sec out of the story, then you have clear text protocols. So what happens is that you end up having a risk that goes really high because the vulnerability kind of stays the same. It's a lot of them, huge. But the attack surface is much closer to you, and the threat, that is most of the time you guys, uh, is actually really increasing because it's much more easy to get into these technologies. 